All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I assume we'll have some more folks joining us as we uh, get rolling here, but we do want to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Uh, we want to welcome you all and thank you so much for joining us today for another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU also provides student learning services for K-12 students through the Michigan Virtual School, as well as professional development opportunities in blended and online learning through its Professional Learning Services Division. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started, this webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information, which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI, unless otherwise specified. Just want to take a couple minutes here to introduce our presenter today, who is Verena Roberts, an open educator, consultant, and University of Calgary doctoral student who is completing her EDD and learning sciences. Verena has taught and developed, and sorry, has taught, developed, and consulted about curriculum and technology integration from pre-K to higher education in Canada, the United States, and Singapore, and currently works works for Rocky View Schools in Alberta as a technology for learning specialist. She has facilitated and developed a wide range of open network learning projects with a focus on open access to learning, open educational resources, emerging professional learning opportunities, and learning pathways for teachers and students. Raina has also worked with a number of school districts in the U.S. and Canada and has consulted with the Canadian eLearning Network, or CanELearn, and iNAPAL, among other organizations. With that, I'm going to hand it over to our presenter, Raina Roberts. Thank you, Justin, and thank you everyone else for being here today. I really appreciate it. So today we're going to talk about some blended learning teacher case studies that I worked on last year, and we actually started about this time last year. Um, just a quick overview of who I am. We just heard about me professionally, but I am a mom and a mom of three kids, and they're all in school right now. And as you can see in this picture, and it, this was of an old schoolhouse in Alberta because I live in Canada, um, and it was in a museum. And the first thing my son did was he went straight to the board and started drawing all over the board. And I thought it 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 doesn't matter in what era or what time everyone likes to play and and draw and learn in their own way. So I had to put that picture out there. Um, and what's interesting about me is that I am currently working with the school district and I am a doctoral, currently a doctoral student. And as I say, I am a mom with three kids, so I have different lenses and views of education at any given moment, um, which makes learning about blended learning in particular quite interesting. So this research was really important because it came from a teacher's perspective and these teachers came from all over Michigan and I'm just going to say their names really quickly because they deserve credit. So it's Michelle Dubois, um, Andrea Phillip, Lori hogan McLean, Catherine Koch, Tanya Leon, Tara Maynard, Brenda said Wright, Milena Schroben, Chris Thomas, Ann Weston, and Angela Malott. And the teaching experience for these teachers ranged from about one year, so they were actually completing their first year of teaching, um, all the way over to 30 years of teaching. And most or many of the teachers started blending learning, blended learning within the last two years. They taught in a wide variety of subject areas and grades, from special education classes to computer science and from second to twelfth grade. And when you go into the paper itself, you'll see the profiles include the teacher's name, their grade levels, their subject areas, the number of years they've, they've been teaching, and how long they've been blended learning in their classrooms. And as I said, the teachers came from all over Michigan. What's important is the way that we um, asked for participation. It was all voluntary, and we sent out word throughout multiple networks throughout Michigan, um, through social networks, through um, 
uh, professional learning, um, email threads, through newsletters, and as I said, all the participants decided to come in, and um, it was voluntary, and there was um, a consent form that was signed, and everything was done through an interview process, which means that I would call them, and, and then um, I would record our recording because I had to transcribe everything that was said, and then we deleted all the recordings and all the transcriptions and created the paper based on their stories. So that's what we're going to be talking today, their stories and their perceptions of blended learning. According to the Christensen Institute, and this was the definition that we followed and, got, and was guiding our paper, was the definition of blended learning as a formal education program in which students learn, in which a student learns at least in part through online learning with some element of student control over time, place, path, or pace, at least in part in a supervised brick and mortar location away from home, and the modalities along each student's learning path within a course or subject are connected to provide an integrated learning experience. And the reason I'm reading this and showing you the model right here, so these are the models based on that definition, which are the rotation model, the flex model, the a la carte model, and the enriched virtual model, is because as you're going to hear, we didn't necessarily hear these words used. We didn't always hear the word blended learning used when describing what teachers were doing in the classroom. They knew the context of blended learning. But what was really interesting are the different perceptions, and you could say like the landscape of blended learning across Michigan, which is really exciting because I felt that it was innovative and innovative, and it was leading future potential of student-focused and student-centered learning. The guiding questions behind our research that I worked on with Katherine Kennedy were what does blended learning mean to you as the teacher? Where did you learn about it and how have you implemented it? That question came from discussions between Catherine and myself around how are teachers learning about blended learning? There's a lot of expectation of blended learning being implemented in school districts, but how are they learning about it? Um, and then how do the teachers themselves keep up with the advances of blended learning practices? And we were really curious about how did they perceive the connection between their professional learning opportunities and the support for student learning in the classroom. Um, and then from our own perspective, from a research perspective, how can professional learning with a focus on blended learning move forward? So what does blended learning really look like in Michigan schools? We had 11 different teachers give us their perspectives. Is it a stereotypical everyone sitting in front of a computer? And this does look like a very dated picture when I think of it, but then on some cases it might not be dated, we don't know. Or is it more, and, and that would be more isolated or independent, or is it more collaborative and interactive where students are getting together and doing things together in front of a computer screen or with each other in um, a face-to-face -face environment? So. These are some of the answers, and yes, there's a lot of text on the next two slides in particular, but I thought it was really interesting for us all to hear what blended learning meant to these teachers. So the majority of teachers used a self-created definition of blended learning, and only one teacher referred to the Christian Institute or any kind of definition of blended learning. They all just came up with their own words in general, except for that one person who referred to something. Um, blended learning is an extension and enhancement of didactic or lecture-based approaches. Blended learning provides opportunities for increased collaboration and student agency. The teacher suggested that engaging in blended learning changed everything that happened in their classroom. And the teachers commented on the changing role of teachers in their new teaching environments where they have moved from being a lecturer to facilitator. Blended learning helped them, in their opinion or their perception, change from being a lecturer to facilitator. The teachers often describe their role as one of facilitator or project manager supporting the learning of the students. The teachers also describe themselves as learners as well as facilitators within a learning community. So a, a, their role was changing and they were part of a team. The teachers are no longer need, being needed for their ability to lecture about content and instead to support students in their understanding, curation, and use of content. 
And success in the classroom is described in terms of how well students were able to demonstrate their understanding of the content in a wide variety of ways, like creating a video or um, meeting in Skype, as opposed to how well a lesson was taught online or face-to-face. Blended learning afforded a transformation from class lesson plans to individual learning plans. Um, yes, Randy, I'm just going to answer your question quickly. As a result of experiencing blended learning and being part of the process, the teachers would definitely say it was transformational regarding their practice. Every single one of them trans would, would describe it as transformational in their own way. So how did they keep up with the advances in blended learning? So they talked about how exciting it was and how transformational, as Randy pointed out, but how did they keep up with it? Well, the first thing they said that they're, in their opinion, there was limited formal professional development opportunities or college programs. In fact, one of them had taken a master's program where they did take an online component. However, they in general said that they didn't know of or they weren't aware of or they didn't know anyone who had taken any formal blended learning program. Um, and I know that in the paper we do cite some sources um, from uh, Catherine Kennedy, for example, and some papers that do cite that, that that's what the current research does support. However, there were some mentoring and coaching um, programs and support being offered throughout Michigan. It wasn't always the same option. And so they're um, not mentioned necessarily by name in the paper, but they there are some mentoring and coaching support programs. There was also self-directed informal professional learning opportunities and that included anything from taking a free online course all the way to um, presenting with other people and um, um, learning through collaboration when maybe a program offered a group to collaborate together so there's networking opportunities. And that, that's the next one, a combination of informal and formal professional um, development opportunities. The big one that was um, really interesting is all the teachers felt that they learned from and with their students in terms of blended learning. So there was a, a large emphasis on what the students were providing in terms of professional learning opportunities and also peer-to-peer -peer learning. In every case, in every case study, you will see an example of how that teacher was dependent and created relationships with other teachers and as a result learned through peer-to-peer -peer learning. Now, these are exciting. These are the changes, this is that transformational part that the teachers have observed as a result of integrated blending in their classroom. The only teacher who couldn't really answer this well was the teacher who was in their first year of teaching. But otherwise, most of the teachers had um, some comments about what they were actually seeing. They felt that students were more engaged and excited about their learning. Um, they felt that students demonstrated mastery of skills and exceeded curriculum and standardized test expectations. And there were some teachers who actually did track that in terms of their data um, because of the expectations that they were asked of from the district um, in terms of um, what data they were to collect. And then they went and collected other data in, form, in the form of formative assessment in order to prove that point in their perspective. Teachers felt that they were able to develop closer relationships with the students due to the time they were able to engage with them. Um, technology provided a means to connect with experts to offer enriched learning opportunities. And I'll go back to that relationship qu uh, point quickly. The teachers talked about because they were able to support their learners with projects online or digital content that met the different needs of each of their students, the where they were at um, type learning. They were able to go and talk and connect with other students at, um, at the same time. And so their time spent during the class time was less about lecturing and more about developing relationships and supporting their students. They also pointed, that was when they were in the face-to-face -face classroom, that's how they developed those deeper relationships. And then in the online component, they talked about how the students would text them um, through software. There weren't any examples of where they were texting people's phones or anything. That, there was um, some comment about the privacy as well. 
But what I mean is through Google uh, Suite, for example, there was Google texting. They also could text through their learning management systems or whatever software their schools provided them with. And the teachers also said that some of the parents would connect with them too when they had questions. So that's how the relationships were developed in a face-to-face -face environment using technology and also in an online environment using technology. Um, the experts they're referring to is they'd be able to connect with people um, at local universities or experts around the country. These experts were also geographic experts, other students who would know about the geography of their areas when they did mystery Skypes and that kind of thing. So the experts is, uh, there's a range of um, definitions behind the experts. Teachers learn about blended learning because they are working on their own and they want to innovate or because they are part of a learning community of innovators. So a lot of these teachers in particular were innovators themselves and they wanted to connect with others and that's how blend, and blended learning provided that option for them to help them connect with others. Social media was easier for most of the teachers to use for professional learning than in the classroom. We didn't actually have any specific examples of using social media in the classroom. Um, and data collection and tracking was unclear with the increase of technolo technological support. What we're referring to there is a, the districts themselves would ask for specific data collection and the teachers would provide that, of course. However, the data collection that the district was being asked for um, was in addition to a lot of the data collection that actually supported the learning and supported the students within the classroom. So the teachers ended up doing two sets of data collection and for future research potential, that data collection that the teachers are doing is, is very different from the data collection that was being collected by the district. Um, we didn't go into a lot of detail on that, but it was interesting that there's basically two sets of data collection going on. What advice would you give to other teachers as they consider blended learning? The first one is consider a growth mindset. Uh, every single one of the teachers and every single one of the case studies gave examples of what a growth mindset, um, and we can think of Carol Dweck when we're thinking of a good example of um, looking up uh, examples of growth mindset. Um, uh, the, the, t the teachers would talk a lot about taking risks, um, things can't be perfect, accepting that students are going to come in um, with different questions and being able to answer those questions and not feel like they have to be the expert all the time and help those students find the answers to those questions. Um, and know that your cup is always half full and not necessarily cup uh, is the cup is half empty. So the attitude that you go in with, you're positive. Um, and also looking at the potential to know that things can get better. For There's lots of examples where the teachers were talking about um, how everything would go wrong, for example, with technology and everything would crash and how they'd work together and with their um, fellow students and their peers in, in order to make a difference. The other key part of blended learning is the student-teacher relationships are essential. The teachers were very dependent upon their students to help them through this transition and transformation in ways that um, haven't been necessarily described in other current research or our past research. Attitude and connecting with others are central, but those are key in any change process. So going blend is actually changing. <laughs> you know, yes. Um, building relationships and having a growth mindset are very human very, very human um, attributes, I would say, and those are the two things that came up the most when we talked about blended learning. And in many cases, people refer to blended learning as only a tool, a technology tool enhancement um, idea, but it is very clear across Michigan, according to these teachers, and they are in districts across Michigan, as we've said, that uh, the growth mindset, having a positive attitude uh, towards change and student-teacher relationships are really the key to blended learning. So these are some extra insights um, based on looking at all of the stories and all of the narratives. And I'm just going to go through them quickly. When we think of the Rogers Innovation Adoption Curve, 
most of the teachers who came and spoke to us were the early adopters. So if you look on the left hand side, which is only 16% um, really of the population of all of, of, of any, one, any one population. For blended learning, we're going for that early majority and late majority, so the 68% of a population. So I'd have some questions about some of the stories that we heard in terms of the perseverance and, and um, the positive attitude, because a lot of the people, the teachers that we spoke with, were those early adopters. I would wonder as uh, from a district perspective, how do I how do I ensure that we think about mindset and building those student teacher relationships in order to meet the early majority and late majority or the the, the, the middle group in terms of innovation and next steps and blended learning. So that comes like Clive Shepard. Um, just recently put out this blog post and he talks about the idea of what's changing when we're thinking blended learning and or not just and we're talking in the context of blended learning and if we look remember the model at the beginning of the four sets of set um, um, blended learning um, uh, models this is a more accurate model or representation of what we heard when we heard all those stories learning doesn't happen in events it happens in stages and, and processes and we have to have time and the flexibility in order to meet those processes. Um, learning doesn't just happen in face-to-face, -face, it happens in remote locations, that was evidence all over. Um, there is a, a change in the dependency of that teacher-student dependency to empowerment and the empowerment of the student but also the empowerment of the teacher. Um, and then we also have the point that it doesn't everything all the learning doesn't have to happen at the same time It happens in your own time in your own moment and we saw lots of examples of how that happened So this is something to think about that these this image might be a better representation of what we heard when we heard all the stories across Michigan Also according to the 11 teachers interviewed creating a personal learning network or a PLN is the most important element for supporting pressure professional learning. The PLNs were all created in various ways and differed in membership, but included fellow colleagues, administrators, parents, students, and other educators from around the world and within Michigan, and depended greatly on the needs of the teachers. So the teacher would choose what their PLN looked like and who they needed within their PLN. This image is by Alec Kuros, who is an educator based out of Saskatchewan in Canada, but I think the network teacher image gives you a great idea of what um, the teachers were referring to when they talked about their dependency on their fellow colleagues, administrators, parents, students, and other educators. Pinterest turned out to be the number one social media used by all 11 teachers in order to learn new things. It wasn't Twitter, it wasn't Facebook, it was Pinterest. So there's a lot of potential in learning more about Pinterest. Um, as you can see in the cartoon, um, well, I think the ideal student teacher relationship is when the kid totally adores you, but lives in mortal terror of you at the same time. Um, Teacher perceived evidence of deeper learning, strong relationships between them and their students, more time in the classroom, and an emphasis on student agency and learning as a result of authentic um, student relationships and more research or more um, awareness about what positive student-teacher relationships look like or um, is also something that could be thought of for the future, for future research. It, <laughs> there was an emphasis on less us and more them. Um, some teachers described, uh, use the words, we're not the sage on the stage, we're, the, we're, we're, the, we're on the side, and what does that mean? Um, <laughs> and I laughed at this from the quote from Seymour Paparo says, I think it's an exaggeration, but there's a lot of truth in saying that when you go to school, the trauma is that you must stop learning and that you must now accept being taught. 
the teachers that were using blended learning are describing blended learning we're talking about how all their students were learning because they were able to develop those relationships and find out what was important to those students and they were able to make those direct connections and bring in the students passion and bring in the students curiosity and make it about the student which is student-centered learning so the biggest learning for the teachers was it was less about them and less about their control and less about their power and shifting that and changing that over to the students um, the collaboration between and amongst the teacher was the key finding in terms to what make, uh, was making their blended learning and professional learning experiences successful. So uh, the collaboration in terms of their professional learning environment, um, some other uh, teachers talked about how they were able to collaborate with others and um, create um, presentations, especially for the McCall Conference in Michigan, and because they were able to create those presentations, they were able to learn in their own way. So in terms of professional learning for the teachers, collaboration was key. And this is, goes back to the mindset, which was the most important thing for a piece of advice. There was strong teacher support around the concept of failure, perseverance, and determination, which not, not only supports the idea of growth mindset, but also suggests that the teachers are using a design thinking process in their continuous iterative instructional design. They kept trying new things. They didn't give up. Failure was seen as um, something to just keep working on. So I just fed through that, but on that note, wanted to see if there were any other questions. Randy, I put it on you or Catherine. <laughs> oh. Great. No, you you can't. Can that was can a question. Sorry, get a little echo back from you. Um, no, I I guess I I love what you you've described. It resonates completely with what I assume to be processes and how blended learning works. I guess this is more of a collective question for everyone here. Is this research does it resonate and reflect blended learning approaches and how teachers are embracing them in other jurisdictions as well? Does anyone have any comment or something to add on that question? I can't say, you know, one way or another from especially the kind of like a research perspective, but I can say like a couple weeks ago, I was at the blended and personalized learning conference in Rhode Island. And I mean, just about every session I was at were centered around these themes of kind of growth mindset and um, willingness to fail. Um, these, these kinds of general themes that we find not only in this research but another publication that we just put out a couple weeks ago that was kind of similar in focus but um, I, I think uh, it's definitely something you would see outside of Michigan for sure. I think the most exciting focus was it was not on the technology. People didn't talk about the technology. They realized that they were going to be frustrated by the technology because it kept changing anyway. And the focus was on, as a human, how can I think about this in a positive perspective, growth mindset, in order to make a difference. And that's what the students were teaching them. They kept trying. Um, so that, that's where they were learning from the students. I think, yeah, the the conference in Rhode Island, Randy, I was watching the Twitter feed about it. Uh, Catherine, did you go to it as well, or Rebecca? Um, I know that, I know, that, I think that you went to it last year as well. Oh, just Justin did. Um, from what I saw from Twitter, it definitely showed a lot of the themes that came up in this. I, I guess, I think, Randy, I think what you're also asking is, did you anticipate these answers and this, um, this response from the teachers. What did you think, what were your assumptions about what they were going to say about professional learning, how they learn, and how they see blended learning across Michigan? 
What I found fascinating about what your research and uh, observations and with teachers was that um, the blended learning was not described in one of Horn and Staker's boxes, that they created their own definition, um, that it was not about technology and you putting content online in an LMS, which is what where most people tend to go. It's not about flipping your practice by pushing homework or lectures on students to do as homework and then getting into, you know, inquiry questions in a classroom, that it really was about a shifting in pedagogy uh, in the principles that you had uh, in terms of what practice is doing. So it really was focused on pedagogy and the term blended learning or using it was just a catalyst to go and change how they were working with students and from didactic uh, content delivery into inquiry, uh, self-directing um, approaches with students. And, and the terms of technology or the structure or, or organization of blended was, was not central. Whereas when I send people to Hornest Dacre's blended learning book, I'm nervous about that because while it does describe blended, it does gives it a textbook uh, sort of a academic view and it's really messy. And I love that when you did this research that teachers described it the way in which they did and it's just messy, which is exactly the way it should be, which means it's creative and probably extremely um, uh, effective. Exactly. It wasn't. It, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't from the textbook. the The original research question was focused on how do they learn about blended learning. Really, what what professional learning are, are is being provided in an informal or formal way, um, or how do the teachers perceive it to be provided in a formal or informal way, and it it turned into as we were talking more, how how have they survived the last few years? Because in some examples, um, I didn't go into all the details from the paper, obviously, but in some examples, people would say, well, we were a one-to-one -one district, and this is what we were told we had to do. Um, and that didn't necessarily work very well. Um, and so they talked about what their administration or what other people did in order to support them, in order to try to help this transformation of, of pedagogy. Um, and in many cases, that coaching and the mentoring was a huge success. Um, and in other cases, it was honestly uh, the, 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 you know, the, like a, a Western kind of analogy where they were just out surviving and, and doing whatever they could, and they just happened to be that random person in the school who wanted to use technology. Um, or in some cases, it was they got a grant, and and it was all about making sure that your whole class didn't use paper anymore. Um, and so they, they all came to this concept of blended learning, which was really transformation of pedagogy, from different perspectives. They didn't come from a, our district is telling us that we have to all be blended learn or or follow blended learning attributes or we have a new blended learning framework. We didn't hear that. We just heard all these different people come from different perspectives and their survival stories over the last five years. And that's why it was so, so messy and so confusing. But the two things that I appreciated so much that came up were the you have to have a growth mindset and you have to be dependent upon those relationships between students and teachers and your colleagues, um, whoever those colleagues are. Bruno is putting out some pretty good um, Ed Surge conference links. Yeah, Randy, so so not matter how they got there, that was the hardest part about all this research because we had all this qualitative data and all these stories that we were hearing. We had to find the common themes, and the common themes were um, the growth mindset and those relationships and the collaboration. Um, yeah, Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, I think that, um, Rena, the messiness of it, oh, hold on just a second. <laughs>
Sorry about that. I had an interruption. Um, so I think the messiness part of it is the beauty of it in reality because a lot of these teachers were coming to this kind of requirement, as you said, um, not really knowing much about what they were getting into, but they were willing to try. And I think that that is a lot of times what the administrators grapple with when, you know, say things come down from more of like in a, in a hierarchical way, like we want you to work on these things. Um, in this way, it felt more homegrown and organic within the teachers. Um, and they really did have to figure out what was the best way to really learn <laughs> while they were doing. Um, it was almost like their own little maker space, a concentrated maker space in the idea of how am I going to start blended learning, blending learning in my classroom. And, and I, I love the, the approach and, and what Justin mentioned in his latest blog post from when he was at the uh, blended conference was that it's not about a technology, it's more about that instructional strategies. Um, and, and that right there is, is exactly, Verena, you know, as you came out of this, <laughs> you were like, well, it's not really about the, and we already knew that, but it was beautiful to see that the teachers were coming to that on their own, um, within their own professional learning, um, that they essentially created themselves. I mean, a lot of them were using social media um, through Twitter and things like that to really understand what they were getting into. I would totally agree. A lot of them were still almost in shell shock through the experience. Um, and I credit um, the the Michigan Virtual Learning Institute, and I've said Learning Research Institute, um, for, for um, curating these stories and asking those questions because you now have a historical context of experience, the teacher's experiences in the moment. Um, which actually totally did remind me of the story. Right now in Canada, we're going through what's called Canada 150 because we're 150 years old and we're talking about the stories of survival and how we came to be Canadians. And, and there, uh, there are a lot of similarities between the, the historical context of becoming a country and the historical context of that transformation and living through that transformation, experiencing it by trusting others um, and and focusing on, on being positive and having that growth mindset and really um, giving giving away um, the powers that might have held people back from learning, I would say. It, the, the teachers often in many cases talked about how they were maybe bored within the classroom or they were getting frustrated and they didn't know what the next step was, they felt overwhelmed by curriculum, and they, that was the only negative piece in the whole interview was sometimes why they decided to try something new. It was because they were at a loss with them, in themselves of why they, it wasn't right what they were doing within their classroom. And then all of them have said, I would never go back. I could never go back to the way I taught before or the way I, I was learning before. Um, and I, I did appreciate how all of them focused on learning rather than necessarily teaching because it was everyone was learning together. That was another big piece. It was actually a wonderful opportunity to, to listen to them all. And uh, yeah, now you have them all collected and you can make some comparisons in the future. Rebecca, do you have anything to add? Because I know that you helped a lot with pulling everything together. Assuming she doesn't have a mic, so it's Brandy speaking again, jumping in. Um, Justin, uh, I've just been texting with Michael Barber in the background. This is a recording and a piece that we would love to, uh, you know, uh, share.
with others as well. So um, I think it's really highlights a really, really nice set of research that has applications in a large variety of different spaces. And I know, as in indicated before, anecdotally, from some of the limited uh, conversations and dialogue that we've had going in Canada, some of the, the, the impacts about blended learning and how teachers approach uh, are parallel to what's happening, certainly in Canada. And I would um, probably guess that it would be similar in other jurisdictions as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'd love to share this as well as the actual publication through a variety of channels as well. So, would be happy to follow up with that afterwards. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Rebecca. Or was it Catherine? Catherine and, and Rebecca. Can everyone hear me? I think we might have some sound issues. Oh, and we just lost Verena. Um, so while Verena is hopefully get, coming back in, I, I just wanted to mention another kind of beautiful piece that came out of this, but it also resonates with something that we did while we were in the Rhode Island schools with Fuse RI, uh, the Fuse Rhode Island group. Um, and they have uh, k kind of like um, the idea of, of lighthouse or uh, fellows that they use um, that go into the various uh, schools. Um, and Verena, thanks <laughs> for coming back in. Hopefully you can hear everything now. OK, cool. Um, can you hear every, everybody? Yeah, sorry for that. That all no. to keep, I just, yeah, everything's good. Excellent. Um, I was just saying that another thing that kind of resonated out of your project, but also resonated back to a project that we worked on with the Rhode Island group um, through Fuse RI was the idea of the teachers feeling that it was important for themselves to have a growth mindset so that they can really um, model that for their students so that they can see as students that failing is OK. Um, we had one teacher in that Fuse RI report where she was just like, you know, I'd come in every day and I would say, hey, we're going to try this out. If it fails, we're going to do something different. <laughs> you know, so it was just that idea that it's not going to be perfect and we're going to be able to kind of learn as we go. And that's so much more important that the students also hear that so that they can have that mindset going forward as well. So um, just that idea of like failing forward and being able to learn from your mistakes and not showing mistakes as total failures in a negative way, like that negative connotation goes away in that growth mindset. It's like, I'm going to learn from all of my mistakes, and the mistakes are learning processes as well. That's a really good point, Catherine. And, um, I think in re in reflection, I did a lot of listening, and I was listening to to how the teachers were describing their experiences and their perceptions. Um, but now, as a researcher, what I think was a little bit different for me is I would go back with those kind of questions and ask, you know, well, do you see this or do you see that, and try to support transformation maybe, and do some research around that. But as a listener. I had to go in and really just observe and listen to what they were saying. And the other thing that came up was um, that whenever I used a word like differentiated learning or personalized learning, and, and I would say, oh, well, you're describing, for example, personalized learning, they'd be like, I don't know what you're saying. So um, using common language and just getting to the point of whatever that someone is trying to explain from a teacher's point of view was far more successful. And I was able to get far more detail. And then it was up to Rebecca and I and Catherine to translate that into those academic words that we're trying to define ourselves in terms of personalized learning or differentiated learning. Um, and although this wasn't necessarily a very academic paper, um, there's still obviously as Randy pointed out, too, with the definition of blended learning, there's a huge discrepancy in what the teachers are hearing. They'll just go out and do their own thing, basically, and they're not necessarily taking word for word what academics or district leaders or whomever might say is the definition of something. Um, 
because learning is learning. And it was very clear that they were describing learning and the most successful ways to learn in their classrooms and how technology supported the student in their learning. That was really the biggest outcome. Randy, what are you writing there? You can take the mic again faster. Okay, why don't I take the mic and say it instead? Um, so, Catherine, your your concept about teachers letting go uh, go of control, um, it, it is actually one of the most frightening things, and I speak from personal experience of um, being the didactic secondary course delivery mechanism that I started my teaching career as to shifting my practice to facilitating learning, giving control and ownership back to students uh, was a frightening gestalt and transformation. Uh, I just about quit teaching because I was faced with that notion, but I learned it when I taught elementary school. Uh, and uh, so, so all of this, what, what comes through here to me is those teachers that, that made those shifts that were okay to fail, that um, really seriously reflected on their own practices and were willing to let go. Um, that Those are exceptional people, but they are also people that must be supported and have a support network. I know that there's various school administrations uh, and school environments that I worked in and I've seen others work in that are not supportive of that, that you would be afraid uh, to try to do anything differently. And I've also been in school environments where those that are trying to work outside of tradition and structure can be actually pushed out. And I've seen people pushed out of schools because they're trying to do this. So I think part of the other part of this equation is, is a question for all of us is how do we encourage the creation of uh, environments that support teachers to fail, that support teachers to work outside in new ways, that, for, that allow teachers to step away from a traditional assessment, final exam driven kind of approach to actually create new inquiry and exploratory ways and means for students to engage. And I think that's partly what blended is being used to, to create. But uh, again, back to it's a, it's a frightening thing to do. And unless I'm supported, I'm probably not going to do it as a teacher. I'm wondering if anyone has other experiences or comments on that. This is Catherine again. I'm going to jump in. I, I, uh, I've seen this a lot. And one of the things that that woman I was mentioning from Rhode Island um, said was that it helped hugely that she had administrator support and that they themselves as, admi as administrators modeled and allowed for and encouraged the teachers to fail forward, to, to really try different things and experiment with things. And it was because that um, teachers initially felt like, oh my gosh, everything is tied to my success and so therefore I can't let go of the control. I have to make sure that I'm on such and such a page number in order to be evaluated in a positive way. And so a lot of it has to do with, you know, am I going to be evaluated for this failure, <laughs> you know? And so there was this idea of letting go of, of that being part of the evaluation process, but maybe even reimagining what the evaluation process looks like so that it kind of builds in that risk-taking factor, that, you know, change management, that mindset change, the growth mindset as part of the evaluation process in particular. And I think that that's one of the things that I think um, Carrie, I can't think of his last name, uh, he's one of the superintendents out in Cal one of the big California districts. I want to say it's one of the, or maybe Orange County. Anyways, he was at the blended conference last year. I'm, I'm sure he's probably there again this year. But um, he acknowledged that in, in the evaluation process that you have to change and actually include that risk-taking factor as well as uh, growth mindset. There were many, many teachers who talked about the support for their, from their administrators. You're right, um, Catherine, but it wasn't just the growth mindset. They had support, they were willing to take risks, but they, they did get um, that 
support and they had to have administrators step right in in that moment. The timely formative assessment that we speak of for the teachers is just as important for the students. Okay, hey, well, if there's no more questions, I think maybe I'll... Uh, not, not for me. I just want to say that I really appreciate uh, the presentation, the research, but also this dialogue. So I want to, even though we're a small group, um, I think that this is, this is an important little piece. And I think that even those looking at the archive, I think will, will be enlightened and refreshed by uh, some of the what was discussed here. So I really want to thank uh, MVLRI as well as obviously Verena uh, and Rebecca for putting this together and the work and Catherine for your leadership uh, with what you're doing. Sometimes the audience doesn't always seem to be there, but I know that these artifacts uh, have a way of living in future areas as well. So the impact is certainly there, but and the leadership is sound and really encourage you to keep that moving forward and hoping that we can start to capitalize more on this uh, through the Canadian e-learning network as well. So thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Verena, for coming and presenting and sharing uh, your work. And thank you to everyone uh, who's in attendance, again, for engaging in that dialogue. I think it is really valuable. And we will remind folks that this will be uh, hosted live on our YouTube channel here within the next 24 hours. Uh, just a couple uh, things to wrap up. Bria, if you'd like to share anything about your contact information or how folks might be able to get in touch with you, feel free. Oops, sorry, you're right. I forgot the last slide. Um, Raina Roberts, and that is my Rocky View Schools web, uh, email address. Um, but the easiest way to get a hold of me is through Twitter at Verena and Beth. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So just a couple housekeeping items before we wrap up. We do want to make mention of a, of a couple of different initiatives uh, that we produce here at MVLRI, including our podcast series uh, called Virtual Viewpoints. You can click the link there to visit our website where you can learn more about our podcast series. You can hear uh, lots of different interviews with folks all over the country, all over the world even, uh, folks who are utilizing research or conducting research in K-12 online and blended learning and how that research is kind of shaping their work. Uh, we also have a guest blogger program. So if you're interested in sharing some of your work in K-12 online and blended research, you can check out our guest blogger program to learn more about the details around that initiative. Our next webinar will be April 20th, which will be actually a Thursday rather than a Wednesday, which is our typical webinar day. And we'll be hearing from Joe Friedoff, who is the vice president here at MVU. Uh, and he will be talking about uh, one of our annual reports that we produce, uh, the Michigan Virtual Learning Effectiveness Report. So we'll be taking a deep dive uh, into a lot of the data that we collect as a state here uh, and learning about um, basically the overall landscape of online and blended learning here in the state based upon uh, the state level collected data that we have. So we hope everyone will be able to join us for that one as well. We'll be sure to send out reminders uh, via Facebook, Twitter, and our email list. And in the meantime, feel free to keep up with all the goings on of MVLRI by signing up for that email list. Uh, the link is included there in the second line of this slide. You can contact us directly at our email address, which is listed there. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can find all of the recordings of all of our webinars on our YouTube channel, uh, which is linked there as well. Uh, you can, again, expect to see the recording of this webinar hosted there within the next 24 hours or so. And you can check out a list of all of our upcoming webinars. We do have webinars scheduled all the way through the next couple of months uh, by checking out our website, mvlri.org slash presentations slash webinars. With that, I will uh, wrap us up and wish everyone a great rest of your week. Take care.